I'm here today with Dr. Lisa Miller. Lisa is the New York Times bestselling author of The Spiritual Child, The New Science on Parenting for Health and Lifelong Thriving. She's also a professor in the clinical psychology program at Teachers College of Columbia University. She's the founder and director of the Spirituality Mind Body Institute the first Ivy League graduate program in spirituality and psychology, and for over a decade has held joint appointments in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University Medical School. Her innovative research has been published in more than 100 empirical peer-reviewed articles in leading journals, including Cerebral Cortex, The American Journey of Psychiatry, and the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Her latest book is The Awakened Brain, the new science of spirituality and our quest for inspired life. Lisa, it's such um, an honor to uh, have you here with us today. Thanks so much for joining us. It's a real joy to be here. And I'm so um, uplifted by your ongoing work and the strength and clarity of your mission, as well as your impact. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's the, the least I can do. But uh, I also want to mention that you know, Lisa's website is lisamillerphd.com. So, you know, I just kind of gave a really brief um, introduction and we'll talk more about Lisa's background. But if you want to dive in and learn more and order her books, please go to lisamillerphd.com. Um, but before we get into your books, Lisa, please tell us a little bit more about your background and the work you do, because, I mean, quite frankly, it's so impressive. <laughs> Well, thank you, Brian. So for nearly 30 years now, I've been a clinical scientist and a clinical psychologist. And way back in the late 90s is when I really started out on an inpatient unit working with people who were in tremendous suffering. And what became clear to me at that point as a new intern, really just having started out in the field, was that there was an enormous spiritual hunger in times of enormous inner pain, in times of loss, the patients felt a pain in their heart that could only be addressed in their relationship to God. And yet, nonetheless, there was a felt sense that that was somehow not done here by psychologists or psychiatrists, that a discussion of your relationship to God was somehow not the job of a mental health provider. So how did this unfold? Well, I, you know, I was a 28 year old intern and patients who had probably faced the most painful week of their lives wanted so dearly to talk about God that they would pull me over into hidden corners of the inpatient unit. Dr. Wow. Miller, will you come stand here behind the door? One patient really, it was, it was the worst night of her life. She was about to be sent after two decades of a failed mental health treatment. She was about to be sent upstate, which means we would never see her again. She was going to a type of facility where people rarely returned. And on the eve of this, you know, I don't want to quite call it a death sentence, but it was the end of her freedom. She said, Dr. Miller, please, will you pray with me? And of course I said, well, of course I'll pray with you. And she said, well, then let's, let's, let's go. And let's go, man. Let's, get away from anyone seeing us. We went through the kitchen door back into the pantry. And then she led me into the corner where the pots and pans were hanging so that it felt safe to pray to God. That I think was the largest violation of the spiritual path of who we are as God's children of what now 30 years later through the lens of science, I've come to see as our foundational spiritual nature to be in relationship to God. And to me, I couldn't be part of a field that annihilated the spiritual life. And so instead of make a fuss, I decided to dedicate my life and many have joined us in building a strong science that shows that we are naturally spiritual beings built to be in relationship to God. It is a miracle. We are gifted. We are endowed with hardwired with a capacity to be in relationship to God. No matter what our word for God may be, my word is God. Some people say Jesus, Hashem, Allah, the universe, but we are built for this. Um, And from that knowing, we also see through the lens of science that when we strengthen this natural capacity, when we build the muscle, if you will, we are 80% less likely to become addicted, 60% less likely to have recurrent major depression. 
we are far more likely to have relationships of commitment, lead an ethical life. Now, this is not surprising from a religious perspective, but what might be exciting to people who know this and need no convincing is the power with which spiritual life and inner wisdom and a felt relationship with God indeed is reflected through the empirical science now, finally. Well, good for you. I mean, because it, it is an area that I think has been short shifted for a long time. I mean, it, you know, there's this natural tendency to separate, you know, science from religion or black or science from spirituality or whatever. And so, but it's so artificial and so wrong. I mean, so, you know, here, here. I'm with you. So very often people will say to me exactly, Brian, as you portray that I, I am a very scientific person. I do not believe in religion or spirituality. For me, I am science-based. And other people will say, I know in my heart that God exists. I am a person of deep faith. It need not be proven through religion. Well, it turns out that spirituality and science can go hand in hand, that science is merely a method. It's a rigorous, very straightforward empirical method. And the lens of science whether that's an MRI study or a telescope or a microscope, the lens of science can be turned and focused on a very broad host of questions. For most of the 20th century, the scientists simply didn't rotate the lens of our method onto the impact of spirituality in the human life. And that was through no fault of witness, right? No fault of science as witness, but rather it was a limitation in the culture what we might call of scientism, the vogue in the air and water, in the culture of being a scientist. Now, finally, really around 2000 was the shift. Mm. Scientists have realized that our perfectly good form of witness, this lens, can look at the impact of spirituality in the human life. And really, it is jaw-dropping. It, it is a form of um, testimony in a way. Wow. Wow. Well, I mean, with the admittedly limited reading that I've done with some of the famous scientists of past, I mean, they really pointed to the unknown, right? They were smart enough, I think, and it dealt in science enough that to know that there's all kinds of things that we don't understand. Right. And, and, and that in the unfolding of nature is the fingerprint of God, of the highest power. Einstein used to say, I want to know God's thoughts. You know, that, yeah. that certainly I, I would never be so bold to say I can tell you about God, but I can look at the impact and the footprint in the sand and the fingerprint and tell you what a sacred world this is. And I have been moved at times to tears by the findings through the MRI machine, by the findings in a long-term clinical course study. Let me give you a taste. Let me give you a taste. We looked at people who suffered terribly for decades and decades and decades through the lens of clinical science. We would call them people at high familial risk for depression. Their mom was depressed. Their grandma was depressed. Their brother was depressed. Right? And what we found was that when someone who's at very high risk for depression starts to turn to God, their higher power, starts to say, I am in terrible pain. God, what do you show me? Starts to say, I see no option. You know, really, it, it's the belly of the whale. You know, where are you? Where are you, God? And has a breakthrough. And then starts to build a personal relationship to God. I turn to God for guidance in times of difficulty. When I'm in a dark moment, I say, what does God want me to do, know to do here? That formation of a personal dynamic, not just it's, it's not just a belief, it is a living relationship with God. When that happens, there is a change in the brain. And we can see it through an MRI machine. Wow. Right? And in particular what we see is that there is greater processing power. There's greater cortical thickness in regions of perception, reflection, and orientation, hmm. the precuneus, parietal, and occipital. And once these regions grow thick, once someone who has suffered or is all lined up to have to suffer some more breaks through to the other side and grows close to God, and then day in and day out prays or looks for God in their life or sees God in one another, Right? Once they live life on sacred ground, these regions of the brain grow thick. And once they do, we become protected against subsequent bouts of depression. We are girded against recurrence. How much so? 
if I am a woman at high risk for depression, I am 90% less likely to have a recurrence if I develop a strong relationship to God. Wow. Now, I'm certainly going to have hard times. No one says that goes away. But the deep, deep downward spiral and its signature in the brain as not thickness, but thinness in those very same regions is reversed through a relationship with God. Wow. So that is what, when we saw that, I, I wanted to cry. I felt like, you know, the way scientists must have felt when they, the atom was split and there was more energy than one could have ever imagined that all the tiniest speck of matter is full of power. You know, it, it was amazing. And that says to me that depression is not our enemy. Depression is not lost time. Depression is not an absence in the narrative of our lives. Depression is an invitation for a deepening of our relationship to God. And when we say yes and open our heart and have that process of drawing closer, God, what do you show me now? Dear God, lift me up today that I might feel your presence, heal my heart, give to others, see God in you and those with whom you work and live. And that is a process that is neuroprotective against depression. Wow. That is just amazing to understand the scientific foundation behind what you just said. So then I go back to the pots and pan <laughs> closet, right? As a young intern on an inner city, in an inner city hospital, she wanted to pray in her darkest hour. Hmm. Well, she was right. She was absolutely right. Now, I don't need to be an expert in her faith tradition. She happened to have been Catholic, and she wanted to use the rosary. And I joined her with full heart and love in her presence and in her prayer. And then she asked me to pray in my way, which I did, and she joined me. We don't need to be expert in every religion on earth in order to show up for each other in a shared relationship to God, to feel so God's presence. Now that to me, you know, mental health absence, spirituality, there's a big donut size hole. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the hospital because you have a broken arm and you leave with TB, that's called iatrogenic harm. You get worse in the hospital, right? To omit spiritual life from recovery, from renewal in times of suffering is a form of iatrogenic harm. It is further disintegrating of the whole person. Mm -hmm. But when the core, the deep spiritual core can be welcomed back into healing and renewal, then the person is reintegrated and made whole. It is our nature to have a spiritual core. Wow. Wow. So since, you know, you're obviously very, you know, steeped educationally in the medical world, what about your spiritual background? Can you comment a little bit about what your journey has looked like? Sure. Um, I had a have, thank God, a very, very spiritual mother. So, um, you know, we're speaking right now primarily of the science in the awakened brain when I tell you about the MRI studies and my patients on the inpatient unit. But I, in addition to the awakened brain, about five, six years ago, I wrote The Spiritual Child, which is really about the first two decades of spiritual development through the lens of science. And perhaps one of the most important findings in both The Spiritual Child and for adults in the awakened brain is that just as we are physical beings and emotional and cognitive beings, every single one of us on earth day one is born innate with an innate capacity for spiritual life. We have natural spirituality from day one. So every child is a spiritual child. We, through the lens of science, this, um, there are fellow labs who have called this implicit spiritual cognition that a child is likely to perceive a child perceives continuity of spirit, continuity of consciousness after death, unless socialized otherwise, that a child perceives the ability to simply know, direct knowing without being told, or to be in connection with an ancestor unless being socialized out of it. So we are born as knowers. We are not a blank slate, no tabula rasa. Right? So when you ask about my path, I'll tell you that like everyone else, I was born a spiritual child. And I'm very grateful that my mother did not socialize me out of mm. our birthright. Mm. My mother saw the world 
day to day on sacred ground. So for instance, we'd sit down to dinner and there'd of course be a prayer of thanks for the food, but then she'd look up to the sky and say, I look at the sunset, look at the pink and the blue. God is so good. I see this sunset and I know that you children, to this day I cry, Brian, you children were gifts of God. That's how she saw every moment, wow. right? Good so it's her. impossible to erase, to have your nature erased if you come home to a parent <laughs> who day in and day out gives voice to God's presence in our lives. Mm -hmm. And that's what she did. And what was very interesting was that in our community, um, there were people of many different faith traditions. And as a child, I felt completely comfortable connecting at the spiritual level. What now we know to be as the one singular spiritual neuro seat of transcendence. There's one awakened brain and we all have it. As a child, we can feel that. So it didn't matter what words they used or which house of worship they went to. In my heart, I could feel that numinousness, that illumination. And that is what now through the lens of science, we might say is the awakened brain, our catcher's mitt to receive transcendent awareness. Hmm. We all have this. And not only that, it is our ability to perceive God's presence, transcendence in one another. It's so interesting, Brian. It turns out our final study after I don't know, 20 years of these MRI studies, right? Was that the same neural correlates that are used to feel and know God's presence in our lives are identical to the neural correlates to perceive God's presence in you, in my colleague, in my friend, in my child, in mm. one another. Mm. So transcendence and imminence, the presence of walking day in and day out, like my mother did on sacred ground. The dinner is a gift from God that the chicken and the peas and the sunset and the brother and the sister, everything in this picture is a gift from God. And in fact, God is in it. That ability to see that is our birthright. We are endowed with it. Hmm. That is our, I call it the awakened brain. It is our endowment, our sacred endowment. Wow. Wow. But we've got to practice and build it because if you look at twin studies, twin studies can tell you the degree to which any quality is innate or environmentally formed. Hmm. Twin studies mirror this truth. They show us that we indeed have an innate capacity for spiritual life. You know, we look at twins raised together, twins raised apart, and factor out the degree of commonality as a function of shared genes and shared environment. So temperament is half innate, half environmentally formed. IQ is 60% innate, 40% environmentally formed. The capacity through which we experience the transcendent is one third innate. It is our birthright but it is also two thirds environmentally formed and cultivated. The muscle must be exercised. Wow. Let it be laid to atrophy. Mm -hmm. And where this is even more important is that we look at the period of puberty. You know, as an expert on faith traditions, every tradition on earth and through time marks physically coming of age as a time of spiritual emergence whether it's the Anipi or the sweat lodge or confirmation or bar bat mitzvah, as we change physically, we have an augmented spiritual awareness. This is a, a truth known through human history. Through the lens of twin studies, we see that too. We see that with puberty through middle to late adolescence, there's a 50% increase in the heritable contribution, which means a surge from the inside out, a biological clock, where we hunger to know truth. What is my meaning? What is my purpose? What is the meaning, the purpose? And everything you ever told me, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, pastor, priest, imam, rabbi, it's up for question based on my hunger to know it in the resonance of my own heart. And for some people that's driven by inquiry and for some people it's driven by a deepening of prayer and meditation. But the decision that a young person makes to make God their own choice is two, that is two, hardwired. Mm. So mm. why do we mark puberty around the world as spiritually significant? Because it is. And indeed, every time that we change physically, midlife, elderhood, we change spiritually. It's well, all one package. Well, certainly, you know, one of the ways environmentally that we're all influenced, you know, to one degree or another is through books, right? And so you've written um, some books that have been, incredibly impactful. And I mentioned in, in the spiritual child. Um, and, you know, this book was recommended to me by multiple people who I'm in conversation with about, you know, family spiritual formation. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
Could you talk just a little bit about that book before we get into the newer book? How, sure. how did spiritual- I'm sorry, I don't have a copy with me. Do you mind holding up your copy? Yeah, so yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks. this is the it, spiritual The Spiritual Child, child. Um, The New Science on Parenting for Health and Lifelong Thriving. So how did that book come about? And what would you say is the main takeaway that has really made it so, I mean, successful and, and so impactful? I think that deep in our heart, as parents, as grandparents, we already know that our child and our grandchild is a deeply spiritual being. The science, I think, touches a truth that we already hold deep within our inner wisdom, but yet is powerfully beautiful as a form of witness to say that, yes, we can tell you through the lens of science that we are innately spiritual beings, and there's a spiritual path walked by every child and then every teen into adulthood. We can mark that pathway, whether we're using twin studies or MRI studies. Perhaps one of the most um, powerful experiences I've had, you know, most of my studies are, are published in top clinical science journals. So, you know, the science is all there. It's referenced in the back and I, and it's made, it's told in English in a way that I hope is, you know, fun to read, but I'm going to tell you a story. Okay. And here's a story. I was teaching at Columbia where I, I've taught for over 20 years. And one day in my class of grownups, right, these are graduate students, there was a knock at the door. And I thought, well, okay, surprising. Let's see who's there. And I open it up and outside my door in the middle of class were nine Navajo girls. That's kind of random. <laughs> well, or, or purposeful, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> right? And in a sacred universe where we are supported and guided, it's we improv, improv is about accepting God's gifts and saying yes. We say yes to that, right? So I said, please come in. And they looked in. They thought they were going to see a classroom of children, but they were grownups. And they said, oh, no, they were frightened. So I went out to the hall. And out there in the hallway in the middle of my class, I told the nine Navajo girls about my personal journey to find my son, Isaiah Lakota, who I found with the spiritual help of the Lakota. And when they heard that and they heard of the non-mechanistic, of the deeply spiritual process with the help of the Lakota through which I'd found my son, they felt that they might be understood. And they walked right back into my classroom. Wow. Wow. So there I was with the nine Navajo girls. I thought, what a blessing. I'll ask them to teach. So I said, will you please teach us something of your culture? The ringleader, you know, and they all adored her. She was a kind ringleader in her pink fleece with her earbuds still in. <laughs> 15, 15, maybe at most 16, stood up in front of 80 adults, walked into the center of the front, you know, the, of the podium effectively and said, I know what I will teach you. She said, when I got my period loud and strong, <laughs> loud and strong, the 80 adults, my grandma, she smudged me and she told me to run here and run here and run there. And she gave me very challenging tasks. And then I dug a big hole and I made a corn cake for my entire community and after that, I sat in the spirit hut for three nights so that I could know my bigger spirituality. Wow. Body, mind, and soul. Body, mind, and spirit coming together, crossing over into a place amongst the whole community. As a contributor, I made a corn cake for the whole community. And as a member of the faith community and as a spir spiritual knower. We have taken the spiritual core out of coming of age, and it is to the peril of our teens. We have never seen as elevated rates of addiction, depression, and suicide. The rate of death by suicide now rivals that in high school of death by auto accident. Hmm. This is because we've taken the spiritual core out of mainstream American culture. 40 years ago, in the good attempt to be inclusive, we made an error. We silenced spiritual voice in public space. And with that, we threw the spiritual baby out with the bathwater. And we have now two generations, like 40 years. A young woman grows up, has a baby grows up. We have an 18 year old now who's never prayed or meditated or read, read sacred text, who's never had the gift of understanding one another as sacred 
beings as emanations of God or the highest power, we have absolutely done the gravest injustice to our young adults. We have given them the two thirds onto the one third in innate capacity, the two thirds environmental emptiness that has led to a near complete atrophy of the spiritual core. And the numbers indeed match up. Hmm. The numbers match up. And ironically, you know, the greatest suffering has been in resourced communities. It turns out that the rates of addiction, depression, and suicide are higher amongst well-resourced communities than in the inner city. I've seen that. Yeah. When I teamed up with my colleague, Sunya Luther, we asked the question, okay, we know that in the United States, 70% of people say spirituality is highly important to me. What is the rate in the highly resourced schools? These were outside of New York, outside of San Francisco. Just to take a guess, what would be the rate? Spirituality is highly important to me of a high schooler. 20%. You know, you know the crisis well. It was even worse. It was 15. Hmm. But you're absolutely right. Less than a quarter of the national rate. Less than a quarter of teens in well-resourced communities, affluent suburbs, have a strong personal relationship to God. So I would naturally, as a parent of three, want to know how to get my child into that one, that 15%, right? I want my child there. I know that that is the source of life, of renewal, of relationship and protection against the most prevalent forms of psychopathology. It turns out that without exception, the 15% of teenagers with a strong spiritual life against the tidal wave of nihilism had a strong spiritual life in their family. They were members of faith communities, the whole family, or communities like Habitat for Humanity of enormous contribution. But somewhere where as a young adult, I show up and it doesn't matter if I just was turned down at seven colleges or got into all of them. You look at me the same way. I'm a child of God. I'm a soul on earth. This teen is viewed every single week in his or her faith community as a being of godliness, infinite worth. Right? And so instead of thinking I'm no better than my parts and pieces, whether I got an A or a C, whether I got into UCLA or was turned down, I know myself as a being of infinite worth. And what is it to be good at math or good at tennis or anything else? That's an endowment. That is a gift through which to serve and identify my contribution. That is not who I am. In Palo Alto right now, outside of Palo Alto High School, there's a train track which has been cordoned off with a fence because following a cluster of suicides, it was determined that if you can delay a teenager for five minutes from taking his or her life, they are unlikely to do it. And we know from other studies that 85% of people who attempt suicide and live, 85% on another day are very glad they're alive. Hmm. So why was it that, you know, in a moment of feeling like a failure, that I'm, I'm not an A, I'm not a B, I am in the conquer of my being, a C on my AP chemistry test. I am nothing. I throw myself in front of the train. We have deprived that child in the air and water of our culture and systematically in the implicit secular materialism in our schools. We have deprived that child of their spiritual awareness. And there is a way to allow spiritual awareness as our natural birthright into all public spaces that is inclusive, that is pluralistic and constitutional. And I've done that for two years with the United States Army. I work for the Pentagon. We go to Fort Bragg. We go to Fort Jackson. And what do we do? Well, together using this same science in the awakened brain, in the spiritual child, I have worked with the Pentagon to rework all of the bands of professional contribution in the army so that the soldier is not just physically fit and ready, but spiritually fit and ready. We go right down to basic training where the new field manual, FM 722, chapter 10, says that holistic soldier fitness is both physically fit, mentally fit, and spiritually fit. Wow. It is essential. Well, if we want fit and performing soldiers who can protect our country, <laughs> and we know this works, don't we also want fit and performing scientists, doctors, lawyers, technicians, bus drivers, waitresses, everybody here needs to be physically fit and spiritually fit. 
and we've taken away their birthright by silencing the voice, by socializing children systematically in schools out of their birthright. Now, this has to be done in a constitutional inclusive way. And in the Collaborative for Spirituality and Education, we do that. We bring people together from public schools and private schools and religious and non-religious schools to talk about the spiritual core, the, the awakened brain that perceives the deep unity that is in and through us, that we're never alone. The awakened brain that perceives that we're guided, that life is not a dead stage, but it is alive. It's connected with God's presence or spirit or guidance. And that we can show up to one another to be loving and guiding. Like a faith community lives every single day. We could live that way in society every single day. Wow. Well, I feel like we could go for a couple of hours of deep conversation around this topic. I mean, it's just so wonderful, quite frankly, Lisa, to hear the impact that you're having and um, the importance. All of hands on deck that we are all happy. Well, all of our I, I know it's no, it's no one person, but um, you know. It's a lot of us together and we're doing <laughs> it together. It's happening and it needs to happen in, in high neon now, right now, because so many people don't know how to pull themselves out of COVID. They're stuck, you know, at the level of an MRI study in a bad brain loop and we can help reboot them, open up their hearts to God's presence. We don't, call on God. God shows up for he or she wishes, but we can create the conditions where we no longer annihilate, systematically annihilate people's natural spiritual awareness and instead honor and love one another as spiritual beings. Well, I think we can do some more together to um, help, <laughs> you know, spread the word about this and, 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 and help people. Um, so, but I know we're crushed for time here. So um, just one more question. Sure. You've obviously come out with these incredible books. Do you have anything coming out or on the horizon yet that you can talk about in terms of next book projects? Oh, well, thank you. So I will share with you that I run the Spirituality Mind Body Institute at Columbia University. So I've been a professor at Columbia since I guess about 99. And I started the Spirituality Mind Body Institute <clears throat> we have some events coming up and I would love you all to join us and they are free. One is Awakened to Campus, helping every campus in our country support the spiritual core of students within and without of faith traditions, the innate natural gift, our endowment. Another is the Collaborative for Spirituality and Education. We host K-12 conferences. Hmm. So the SMBI, Spirituality Mind Body Institute. Good, good. I will... Um put the links to those in along with this recording um, to make sure that people can, can find it. And, uh, and also, you know, just again, want to point out that, you know, Lisa's website is uh, Lisa Miller, PhD.com. And the new book is the awakened brain, the new science of spirituality and our quest for an inspired life. Will so you show Lisa, everybody? Show yeah. Them. I mean, um, that's Lisa. it. <laughs> I've already been paid. This isn't a commercial. I want to work together. <laughs> use the science. <laughs> so Lisa, I, I can't thank you enough uh, for joining us and for this incredible work that you've done. So um, uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, it's an honor forward. to be here. And I'm grateful given who is part of your learning community, that this science might be used by the profoundly spiritual activists who are part of this Absolutely. beautiful community you've created. I, I think it resonates quite uh, dramatically. So, um, so more to come. Thank All you. right, Lisa, thank you again so much.